Let's imagine a new possibility. What would it mean if every human being in reality experienced the full dignity of their own desire? What would it mean if every human being knew that they were desired? But not just by one person. You don't exile your desire to one person to fulfill in a particular way. What if I knew I was desired by reality itself? We're going to do a, a kind of review of culture today and, and a tragic moment in culture which captures the need for the new story, right? The need to articulate a new set of frameworks, a new story rooted in first values and first principles, right? A story of value, right? A story of intrinsic value rooted in first values and first principles. In the last several broadcasts, we've been talking about right, the ontology of story, that story is a real structure of cosmos. And part of that story Part of that story of value rooted in first principles and first values is a series of plot lines and the plot lines address specific questions. And it's only when we've addressed, we've engaged those questions in a non-fundamentalist way, in a non-regressive pre-modern way, right? But also in a non-deconstructing post-modern way, right? In a non-subjectivist, you know, reductionist, materialist, relativistic way. If we can actually get beyond regressive premodernism and post-truth, post-truth, post-modernism, and actually find our way to what is utterly essential today, right? A universal grammar of value. Right, friends, the collapse of value is more threatening to humanity than any other single existential risk, and it's the source of every existential risk. Because the global intimacy disorder, which is the root cause that underlies the generator functions of existential risk, is rooted in a global intimacy disorder, which can only be healed by a new story, a shared story. And a shared story has got to be a shared story of the real, right? A shared story of the real, right? There's the politics of the real, what we determine to be real. So we need a shared story of the real, and the real has to include value. Value is real. Value is not contrived. And when you look at a classical postmodern writer like my colleague Yuval Harari, who says that the difference between Libya's Gaddafi right, and universal human rights is non-existent. They're both fictions. They're both figments of our imagination. They're both social constructions of reality. His book, Sapiens, chapter two. And no one raises an eyebrow. That's a given, right? That's the postmodern trope. Right. Harari didn't make it up. He hasn't even thought it through well, with all due respect to you, all brother, right? But he's parroting kind of a postmodern set of assumptions. And that's why his book's important. It's important because it's an uncontaminated view, I meaning it's a naive, right, parroting, right, of a postmodern trope, right, which assumes that there is no real value. Now, what I want to talk about today, just for a few minutes, is this book, this book, The Right to Sex. Right, um, Feminism in the 21st Century by Amiya, Amiya Srinivasan, who I mentioned earlier, we have a, a similar alma mater. We were um, at Oxford, at Oxford University. We both wrote our DPhils there. And, you know, first off, blessings to Amiya on a good publication and blessings on, you know, on your academic career and all, all sorts of good things and full honor to you, of course. You know, we honor each other as human beings. And, and I think the book is, is a, a tragic expression of the postmodern breakdown of value in which you literally, you literally can't even have a conversation. So the book is called The Right to Sex, but the point of the book is that there is no right to sex. That's the point. There is, right, the, the point that Amiya is making is the notion that there's a right to sex, the notion that there's a right to desire is absurd. Now, I want to go slow. The, the way Amiya gets to this is, is by caricaturing the right to sex and caricaturing the right to desire. She talks about the incel movement, right? Involuntary celibates, which is a serious movement in the world, which has some tragic, terrible misogynistic expressions. And indeed, right, Amiya talks about the tragedy of Elliot Rogers, who wrote an incel manifesto, who was a mass murderer. He went and murdered, right, people as an expression of his rage. But that's not what the incel movement's about. 
that just like sexuality is not about the most degraded pornography, right? And and spirit is not about the most degraded expressions of spirit, and masculinity is not about Elliot Rogers, right? And the incel movement's not about Elliot Rogers, right? The incel movement is about a frustration with sexuality in the world. And it's not even about the incel movement. It's about right, a tragic collapse of Eros right, at the center of society. And what Amiya does is she says, well, of course, no one has a right to sex. No one has a right to desire. But what she means by that is, right, and it's deceptive, is that no one has a right to demand that someone else desire them. Or no one has a right to demand that someone else have sex with them. So that's it. Even that is only generally true, right? Obviously, right? As a general principle, that's axiomatic. That's a given. We all understand that. But that, that's a given. That's obvious. Right? That doesn't need a book. But actually, there are relationships in which there is, there is a demand for desire and a demand for sexuality. When I mean, there's a committed relationship where people are committed to each other, right? They actually have, right, an actual obligation or responsibility, right, if it's an amorous relationship to actually find their desire for each other. That's a, that's a shocking idea. For example, I'll give you a shocking example of it, right? In right Hebrew wisdom, there's a principle called ona, O-N-A-H, which means that a woman has a right to make sexual demands on her man. Well, because that's part of the exchange, right? Now, let's be really clear, that has nothing to do with, right, marital rape. Right? Obviously. It has nothing to do with coercion. Right? Obviously. But it means that we actually don't wait for desire to happen to us. Right? Right? Emil used desire as this perverse, strange thing that we have no real relationship to. We have, right? It's however it works, we're not sure. And, and certainly we can't be asked to cultivate or change the nature of our desires. That's not quite true. Right? Actually, desire is an expression of something much deeper, and we're going to talk about desire. But we can actually take responsibility for our arousal. It's actually a big deal. We can take responsibility for our desire. That we actually we can be in relationship to our desire. But but to do that, we got to step back in a much much bigger and wider way. Because so let's see if we can kind of find our way. Here's the tragedy of this book. This is a book about desire and sexuality, and in the entire book there's no narrative of desire. There's no story of desire. There's no probing of the intrinsic nature of desire itself. Desire is understood as a chance expression, right, of some random mutations and cosmos that generated evolutionary psychology that produced us as these accidents of social, cultural, and psychological conditioning, which all transmutes into this kind of strange right, expressions of desire, which run us and we don't run them. And of course, we need to control it, right, to be a good citizen, to be a good person. That's what desire is. There's no narrative of desire. There's no sexual narrative in the book. There's no universe story. There's no narrative of identity. There's no narrative of community. In other words, the essential questions, who am I? Who am I? Who are we? Where am I? Right? Where did we come from? Right? Where are we going? And all of those questions, the essential frameworks, the inescapable frameworks, which every human being must live, are all completely ignored in the book. They don't exist. Because, because Amiya is trying to meet postmodern woke political correctness. So you can't address any of these issues. Now, Without a universe story, and without a narrative of identity, right? Without a narrative of communion, of intimate communion, without a story of value rooted in first principles and first values, not pre-modern regressive, right? Not preordained. What are the intrinsic values that live in cosmos? How do we articulate an evolving parentalism, meaning an evolving sense of shared first principles and first values, right? What does it mean to be in a universal grammar of value where I can locate myself, I can be at home? All that's ignored. And from that place, we have basically a collapse of sexual narrative. There's no sexual story. 
So, so what happens? Let's just understand. So se sexuality is, as is acknowledged by Amiya, the most powerful experience we have. But we have no story to meet our experience, right? The old story of sex sacred, sex is sacred because it creates babies, it doesn't hold. 99% right? of our sexuality is not to create babies. And we have a population explosion. So we've got to actually be wary of population. So sex sacred, no. Sex negative, at the kind of pejorative view of sex is dangerous, doesn't take us home. Yes, sex is dangerous, but sex is more than dangerous. It's more than sex negative. The kind of sex neutral kind of Kinsey approach, sex is like having a sandwich. Well, sex is not having lunch. And Amiya realizes, she says, well, sex isn't like having a sandwich, but, but we don't know what it is. So that's sex neutral, sex is having a sandwich, or sex positive, sex is lovely, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's um, affiliative, right? It's, it's encouraging of good relationship, right? It's kind of a bland sex positive, which doesn't capture the mystery, right? The, the awestruck, numinous, strange, unimaginable depth of the sexual. So sex negative, sex positive, sex neutral and sex, right? Sex sacred. All of these narratives kind of are disappeared from our life appropriately because they don't meet our sexual experience. So we're left with the most powerful human experience without a narrative. But we can't express a sexual narrative unless, ready? Unless we have a universe story, right? Unless we have a story of identity, unless we have a story of community. So, so let's see if we can find our way here. Okay, let's see if we can find our way. And it's very beautiful, it's very powerful. Actually, the way we understand reality based on first values and first principles, based on an integration of multiple strains in pre-modern interior sciences, multiple strains in modern psychology, modern anthropology, right? modern physics, and particularly the new physics, molecular biology, systems theory, chaos theory, complexity theory, none of this appears in Amiya's book. And meaning evolutionary psychology, right, appears right on the side, but actually genuine evolutionary thought science is non-existent, right? In other words, all of the most important emergence theory, right, all of the most important fields of human endeavor are actually absent from a book which basically spends its time recapitulating the ar early arguments in second wave feminism and comes down pretty much on the side with some caveats of the relatively anti-masculine right, dimension of feminism, which was the Catherine McKinnon, Andrea Dworkin school. That's basically the school right, that, that Amiya subscribes to. That's the conversation. But that, that's a dead conversation, sister. Hello, wake up, right? You've ignored literally every single important field of human endeavor in the interior and exterior sciences. And then you're talking about sexuality. And then you're actually exiling the notion of a right to sex to a right to desire, right? To, to a per perverse and strange idea, right? The strange thought that you have a right to demand sex from someone, right? Or you have a right to demand that someone desire you that you're not in deep and profound relationship with. Well, of course, of course not. We understand that. So let's see if we can articulate, right? A real universe story, right? Friends, reality, right, reality is actually a cosmoerotic universe. And allurement, desire itself is a feature of cosmos. Subatomic particles come together to create a larger whole because they desire each other. Alfred North Whitehead, the process philosopher who writes Principa Mathematica, not far from Oxford and Cambridge, with Bertrand Russell, talks about the appetition of cosmos. Right? The appetites of cosmos, which was a polite Cambridge way in 1925 to say desire. Cosmos desires. Cosmos is filled with eros. Eros is the movement generated by allurement, or what White had called prehension. Right? What Charles Sanders Peirce talked about in his language, and James Mark Baldwin, right? the polymath, talked about in his language. And the interior sciences use their language. For example, Liner in the 18th century talks about chuka, the intrinsic throb of desire and allurement. Meister Eckhart, 
right, that animates and drives reality itself, the eros that animates the very four forces of cosmos, the strong and weak nuclear, the electromagnetic, right, the gravitational, right? What is gravity? Gravity is, what's underneath gravity? What's underneath gravity? Nothing, right? Gravity is just a word that we use to describe vectors of autonomy and allurement. Reality is allurement all the way down and all the way up from subatomic particles that are allured together, that desire each other and desire each other uniquely and come together in eros to create a larger whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. Desire is actually the nature of reality itself. Reality is desire. Reality is allurement all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain. And desire is actually a first principle of reality. Now that doesn't mean that desire right, violates the boundaries of the good, of course not. Right? Desire lives in the context of the larger field of desire. Desire is not something that lives in a Mia or Mark as we're sitting in Oxford at the pub next to where C.S. Lewis wrote his books. No, the desire that lives in a Mia and the desire that lives in Mark and the desire that lives in all of us is the same desire that's part of the larger field of desire. So desire is an expression of eros and eros and ethos are one. Eros is the movement towards ever deeper contact and ever larger wholeness. So eros is an organizing principle which brings ostensibly separate parts who are already allured to each other, meaning they're already part of a larger wholeness. It brings them into contact and creates new wholes. So eros itself is a form of ethics. Ethics is how different parts come together and form larger wholes in, in, in radical mutuality, right? mutualities of union, mutualities of recognition mutualities of desire, mutualities of embrace. You can't talk about there's no right to desire, no right to sex, right? And, and reduce that to an obvious absurdity when you're talking about a murderous incel, Elliot Rogers, and say, oh, how absurd there is to think as he did that there's a right to sex and a right to desire. Well, we all know that, right? It actually insults our intelligence and mocks our humanity, right? To actually suggest that that's what we mean by the right to desire. No, it doesn't. The right to desire means that every human being participates in cosmos. It's a participatory cosmos. All right, John Archibald Wheeler wrote from the perspective of physics, right? We live in a participatory universe. And from the perspective of interior sciences, that's always been true, right? Precisely what we understood, right? Throughout reality and the tradition of the interior sciences is that we participate in cosmos. The entire field of desire lives in us. Every muon and every hadron and every lepton, subatomic particles, atoms, right? Atoms that come together as molecules, molecules that are allured together as macromolecules, macromolecules that come together as cells, cells that respond to the oxygen crisis in humanity. And then through a series of allurements come together and form a new configuration of intimacy and desire, multicellular intelligence that then, then opens the portal, right? To the animal world and the human world, right? It's actually one world. It's one cosmos. It's one heart. It's one desire. It's one love. Now, that doesn't mean that desire between subatomic particles looks like desire between human beings. There's continuity and discontinuity, right? There's the world of matter and its desires at every level. And then there's the world of life and then every level of emergence in the world of life. And then the self-reflective human world. And we call those the three big bangs, right? These three great emergences. And then in the human world, right? There's actually evolution, right? Of eros and evolution of uniqueness, evolution of complexity and evolution of intimacy and evolution of interconnectivity. Those are the plot lines of cosmos. And at every stage of that evolution, desire evolves, of course. But it's the same quality, it's the same field. So it's not sex negative or sex positive. And it's not sex neutral or sex sacred because it creates babies. It's actually sex erotic. Sex is an expression of eros, right? And the eros of cosmos lives and moves through me. Right? And eros's qualities are desire, a desire for ever deeper contact. A desire for ever deeper intimacy, ever deeper levels of mutuality, recognition, union, and embrace. And it's only when I realize that that desire that lives in me is the desire of cosmos uniquely expressed as me. That I actually realize that arousal is a quality of cosmos itself, right? Kashmir Shaivism, one of the, the original and the most important native Indian philosophies that gives birth to Hinduism, right? Speaks of the stirring of Bhinavagupta. 
Right? The great thinker speaks of the stirring of desire in the intimate. Right? And actually in um an All Souls College, right, Amiya, where you're teaching. It's an excellent Kashmir Shaivite scholar, one of the best Kashmir Shaivite scholars in, in the world, who teaches Abhinav Gupta at Alexis Sanderson. We have had the, the delight to have lunch with a number of times when we were together in Portland. And, and look at Abhinav Gupta, the stirring of desire in the intimate, at the allurement that defines cosmos. All of a sudden, I realized that my desires, right, yes, they're mediated through my particular conditioning at a particular time. Yes, they're shaped and formed by my early childhood, by my joys, by my ecstasies and my traumas. And yes, we need to work with them in all those ways, but at their core, right, my desire is an expression of the sacred. And it's why in the Solomon tradition, all of in the sacred writ, we say there are 24 books in the sacred writ in the, the, the great Hebrew wisdom tradition. And of all the 24 books, we say that all the books are sacred, all the books are holy, but says Akiva in the first century, paralleling, paralleling Jesus. Akiva says, Kol kodesh, shira shirim kodesh kodeshim. And all the books are holy. And the Song of Songs is holy of holies. And what is the Song of Songs? The Song of Songs models the sacred, models ethos on desire. The Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs is a song of desire between the beloveds. And in the play of that desire, all ethics is learned. The same Akiva who says that all the books are sacred, but the only the Holy of Holies is Sanctum Sanctorum, right? Holy of Holies. The same Akiva says that if we had no law, right? We had no law at all. We could learn all ethos, all wisdom from desire itself, from the Song of Solomon. So once I begin to understand that, I can read this week's code. We wrote just this morning, right? And we wrote it, you know, for Amiya, right? In response to the right to sex. Yet there is a right to desire. Let's use the word desire. We all have a right to be desired, not by anyone, and not in, in a particular way that we demand, right, right, at our beck and call. But as human beings, we have a fundamental need. We have a need to be desired. That need is inherent at every level of reality and appears in the human being. We have a need to be desired. It's not an accident of evolution. It's structural to cosmos itself. Desire itself is a first principle and first value of cosmos. And all of the desire, all of the, the history of desire, all of the ladder of desire in cosmos lives in me. Literally, quite literally. That's what actually evolutionary thought teaches us. And we're a new emergent in that long and great story of desire, right? So my desire is an expression of reality's desire, but it's even more than that. Reality is desiring me. And that's what it means to be alive. It means that actually the allurement of cosmos, right, at all of its scientific expressions, comes together uniquely in a unique configuration of desire with intention to manifest Amiya, Mark. Right? Who am I? Who are you? You're an irreducibly unique expression of the love desire the love intelligence and the love beauty of all that is. That desired, intended, needed, chose to incarnate in your irreducible uniqueness. And your irreducible uniqueness, your irreducible quality of intimacy is intended by cosmos. Wow. And your desire is intended by cosmos. So if you actually begin to access this and access it not as dogma, this is nothing to do with dogma. This is nothing to do with pre-modern fundamentalism. It's actually a direct understanding of an integration of the interior and exterior sciences, but you can also access it directly in what I would call anthro-ontologically. Anthro, anthro, anthropomorphic human being, ontological, it's real. You can actually access your need to be desired inside of you. And that's what we would call a common sense sacred axiom, right? New, new, new language we're using, right? You actually know you know of your need to be desired. You know it inside of you. Every human being has a need to be desired. Not tinsel, superficial, pretty human beings, right? Not men and women parading, as Hafiz says, in their pretty costumes. But every incarnate human being has a radical need to be desired. And needs create rights, right? If I have a need for food, then I have a right to food. 
I have a need for air, I have a right to air. If I have a need, a fundamental need for, for unique expression, then I have a right to unique expression. We have a need to be desired. We have a need to be touched. We have a need to be touched. We have a need to be touched emotionally. We have a need to be touched physically. We have a need to be touched spiritually. We have a need to be touched psychologically. We have a need to be touched existentially, right? And we have a need to feel the cosmic eros performed in our flesh. We have a need to be loved open. We have a need to be fucked open. We have a need to love each other open and to fuck each other open. We have a need to fuck the moment open, right? Not fuck small fuck, not some strange boundary violating, obviously preposterous right, right? To kind of small sex fuck in a way that's not radically mutual and radically gorgeous. No, obviously that's not what we're talking about. But when we say to fuck reality open, what we mean is, and I'm gonna use this word intentionally just this one time because it captures something that's important, right? There's this quality of eros and that's not just captured by the word love. That there's a love fuck quality of cosmos. And we have a need to be loved open, to be fucked open by reality until our hearts are wide open and to love reality open and to fuck reality open, right? And actually that quality of eros, that quality of desire lives uniquely in us. So we're both desired uniquely by cosmos and our deepest heart's desire is the desire of cosmos uniquely alive in us. See, now we can begin to have a conversation. And nothing I said was left-wing or right-wing or incel or gender feminist or power feminist or victim feminist, right? And it wasn't Catherine McKinnon, right? And, right, and it wasn't Susan Brownmiller. Right? Th these, are, these are structures of reality. How do you write a book about the right to desire when you mean the right to desire in a mocking way? And we're mocking the basic experience of human beings. Human beings experience themselves with a profound need to be desired, right? And until we actually realize that sex is not negative or neutral or sacred because it creates babies or blandly positive, sex erotic desires the desire of cosmos awake and alive in me and that the sexual models the erotic, right? And so I've got to get from right, the clarity of my desire for cosmic eros performed in my flesh to my deepest heart's desire to give my unique gift, to sing my unique song, to write my unique poem, right? to participate in the evolution of love, to live a life that's significant, right? On every level, that's desire. Yeah, we have a right to desire. It's a fundamental human right. We have a right to be desired, right? We gotta take right, the conversation out of a bland, postmodern, deconstructive conversation where we literally miss what it means to be a human being. I wanna say one last thing. You know, Willem Reich, complicated student of Freud, wrote a book called The Mass Psychology of Fascism. What he traces there is when there's a breakdown in Eros, although he doesn't use these words, and, and I talk about this with Christine in our book, A Return to Eros. When there's a breakdown of Eros, right, of the fullness of my life, there's a breakdown in ethics, right? We're not supposed to write, our goal today in, in the contemporary world is to live long lives. Our goal is not to live long lives. Our goal is to live full lives, right? Dripping with eros, tumescent with aliveness and ethos, right? Gifting the best of ourselves, understanding that we've got to be omni-considerate, that we're actually, we're for the sake of the whole, even as we understand that the whole lives in us. All of the desire of reality shimmers in us and needs us, right? Wow, right? And need is a right. And the community has an obligation to enact that right. Does that mean we have to go and have sex with everyone? Of course not. But it means we need to teach a narrative of self that takes us beyond superficial desire and takes us to a deeper level of what desire is. How do we actually learn to take responsibility for our arousal, right? And, and arousal might be, I'm, I'm insanely moved to kiss your shoulder for 17 hours and you're my partner. And all I can think about is kissing your shoulder. And for a year, we don't have sex. I just kiss your shoulder and, and ravish you open with my heart madly in love with you, right? In other words, when we talk about sexing, it can't be about a particular form of sexing, a particular form of genital penetration that looks a particular way and feels a particular way, right? Sexing means we have a desire to make contact with each other, to touch each other, to feel each other, to be in devotion to each other, right? To arouse each other in, in a thousand gorgeous ways. 
And, and there's room for all of it on the table. I right? remember Leonard Cohen. How did Leonard Cohen say it? And what was that song? I, I found it this morning. Leonard, Leonard Cohen sings, I'm your man. If you want a lover, I'll do anything you ask me to. And if you want another kind of love, I'll wear a mask for you. If you want a partner, take my hand. Or if you want to strike me down in anger, here I stand. I'm your man. If you want a boxer, I'll step into the ring for you. If you want a doctor, I'll examine every inch of you. If you want a driver, climb inside. If you want to take me for a ride, you know you can. You know you can. I'm your man. All right? I'm your woman. I'm your man. What Leonard Cohen is saying is, let's show up for each other. Let's meet each other in the raw dignity of desire, in the raw divinity of desire. We're all desires right? That, that, that live in the context of ethos, that serve the larger field of desire. There is no local desire. All desire lives in the field of desire. And we need to reclaim the dignity of desire. We need to reclaim the dignity of desire. We need to reclaim the divinity of desire. We need to look at our beloved and say, I'm your woman. I'm your man. Love me open in that dance of mutuality. We need to understand that desire is love in the body. Desire is love in the body. We can, and with that, with those inescapable frameworks, we can begin to take responsibility for our arousal. And that's how we're going to move past sexual harassment, right? And that's how we're going to move past false complaints against men. And by the way, Amiya right, cites the literature in a very, very, very cherry picking way and ignores an enormous amount of literature about false complaints against men because she's trying to fit into a particular woke narrative. But actually there are false complaints and they're real and they're, they're, they're actually much more than, than she allows. Right? So we've got to actually own the shadow of our desire. When my desire wasn't meant, how did it become a false complaint? We can do that with a new narrative of desire. Right? We brutalized male desire and demonized it. But actually, male desire is not demonic. Right? Yes, there's male excess. Sexual harassment, we have no tolerance for one iota. Me too had important things to say. So, so men have to right, up-level, but, but most men are up-leveled. Right? Most men are beautiful. Men are not demonic rapists right? Of course not, right? So, so men have to kind of own the beauty and dignity of their desire and, and make an absolute no to the masculine that would sexually harass, right? And that voice in them that would. And women, right? Women have to actually claim the dignity of their desire, right? And, and women are split off from their desire, right? And that, that sense of the feminine that's split off from their desire, right, needs to be claimed, right? And there's an enormous amount of literature from Meredith Chivers, Right, Peter Bergner, the talk about the, the, the kind of the, the, the feminine that's split off from claiming the dignity of its own desire. Right? So we gotta stop splitting off the feminine from its desire. In Hebrew wisdom, that's called Lilith, when feminine desire is demonized. And I was privileged to write a book about, about the dignity of desire in that sense, right? On Lilith, right? tracing 2,000 years of Aramaic sources in, in that regard, which is critically important. And we've gotta stop demonizing and brutalizing and problematizing male desire. We can only do that. If we have genuine narratives, genuine new stories, genuine imagination. And maybe I'll, I'll end this with a quote from Andrea Dworkin, who I, I couldn't disagree with Andrea on pretty much everything, but, but both of me and I love this quote, right? So, so I'll read it to you, right? And it's about reclaiming sexual imagination. But as Andrea Dworkin writes, imagination is not a synonym for sexual fantasy, which for so many people is only a pathetically programmed tape loop repeating and repeating in the mind. Imagination means to find new meanings and new forms, new values and acts. The person with imagination is pushed forward by it into a world of possibility and risk, a distinct world of meaning and choice, right? That's what we need, right? Imagination, we need to be homo imaginis, Adam. The word Adam, which included originally the masculine and the feminine in the great myths, right? Adam means imagination. So we're homo imaginis. We need to reimagine sexuality. And we can only do that by reimagining desire. And we can only do that by claiming and articulating a new narrative of desire, right? In which fantasy becomes gorgeous, an expression of the movement of cosmos itself, which imagines new possibility. White, it talks about reality as the emergence of imagination, the creative advance of novelty, meaning reality is always imagining new possibility. Let's imagine new possibility. What would it mean if every human being in reality experienced
the full dignity of their own desire? What would it mean if every human being knew that they were desired? But not just by one person. You don't exile your desire to one person to fulfill in a particular way. What if I knew I was desired by reality itself? That my irreducible uniqueness was desired and I could rest in that. And from that place, every body form and every shape that could actually be confident and attract and allure desire to it. Every human being deserves to be desired. Every human being has a right to sex. Every human being has a right to be desired. Every human being has a right to the dignity of their clarified desire that's needed by cosmos because your clarified desire, your deepest heart's desire is the desire of evolution awake in you. And every human being has a right to know that you're desired. You're madly desired by cosmos itself.